our, our, our next speaker is the only non-oil and gas person here today. And the reason I specifically invited Robert to come here is because I think we're about to see a huge step change in the lithium industry, and Robert's company is one of the forefront leaders of this. I, I don't know at the end of the day if history will say they were the first, but they're going to be one of the first. And the way that he's going to produce lithium is very, it's exactly like what shale is to oil, Robert and his team are to lithium. And that's not a small statement. That is a big statement. But I really believe that he's going to explain to you today how their brine processing out of uh, underground aquifers is going to be the low cost solution and beat hard rock, beat uh, high altitude solars, and really become the new de facto low cost part of the curve right here in North America, bringing all kinds of jobs and economic benefits with it that would give everybody lots of reason to get behind what they're doing. So Robert, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Thank you for sticking around today as well. And thanks, Keith, for including us as the only non-oil and gas company on the uh, symposium today. Let me just see if I've got this right. Forward-looking statement. I've got a hard copy of it here if anybody wants to read it. But um, I've been working in the lithium space for the better part of the last decade. Uh, I started Standard Lithium with our team just in the spring of 2017. There's probably uh, close to probably greater than 200 companies in the electric metal space, most of them in the lithium space, trading on the, either the Venture, the TSX, or the ASX right now. So when we started in 2017, we didn't want to be just one of the pack. So when the business model that we put together was a pretty simple but very disciplined model to find the fastest way to production. We weren't interested in chasing after grade on a remote salars in Chile or Argentina or hard rock projects. Uh, I was at the TSX Venture Investor Day a couple of weeks back and I was, I think, the fourth presenter after a number of uh, mining companies and they were talking about their geologists and how they had found high grade record discoveries on remote outcroppings and as I've been trying to formulate a, our presentations and a new narrative to explain our business approach, I went up and I explained to the audience that it was great to follow all of these Hall of Fame geologists and their news releases about these high grade discoveries but you're not likely to ever hear a news release from Standard Lithium saying we've made a discovery because we're not interested in discovery. We're interested in finding projects that are actually in production already, signing agreements with existing producers on assets that have lithium, produc lithium production opportunities. They've just been overlooked because, as Keith hinted at, they, they don't fit a conventional um, processing model. So um, he sort of stole my thunder with the analogy about uh, unconventional oil. But the approach we're taking is that there, there are assets. There's not a lot, not like the oil industry where you have massive shale assets. There are assets, and there, there are assets in the U.S. that can be unlocked just by applying the right technology to it. So we started the company in 2017 with that simple uh, but disciplined business model. I'm not the technical part of the company. I put to, uh, we put together a team that's corporately based for developing strategic, strategic relationships, but also a highly technical team of resource assessment professionals, but uh, most importantly, process engineers. Uh, not process engineers that are working to build a black box and try and sell it to somebody, but process engineers that look at a project and then work backwards to find out how to unlock it. So in 2017 and 2018, just actually just basically a year now since we started the company, we've signed some significant agreements with existing producers in the U.S. that have moved us. We're slotted in the mining sector in the TSX as an exploration company, but we don't consider ourselves explorers because we're not looking for resources. We're actually project developers because we're working on projects that are in production. So over the last year, we've signed three agreements with existing producers. We don't have any resource reports out, but it's an investment opportunity. Those are on the near-term horizon because the ability we've had to leverage the agreements we have, we're able to go in, do work on projects immediately, and we'll be having a number of 43-101, so mining technical reports on the assets coming out over the next 90 to 120 days. I've just got some background on the lithium space, a few slides, just in case you're not up to speed on it. 
Um, we can, I'll try and go through this quickly in case you have questions on it, but the first slide is on the global supply. So you can see if you can, if I've got uh, hard copies of this I can share later with you as well. Most of the world's supply of lithium comes from Australia and Chile that make up almost 80% of it. Uh, South America between Australia, sorry, uh, uh, Chile and Argentina makes up over 50% of it. The US and Canada are a rounding error in it. Not to say that they don't have lithium assets, it's particularly in the US, but they're not conventional assets. They don't, they're not low hanging fruit for, uh, uh, for processors to develop. The main use of lithium today, if we looked at this slide 10 years ago, it wouldn't look like this, but the main use for high value items in, for lithium producers is in energy storage. So batteries for your cell phone, power tools, primarily it's driven now but uh, is by EVs, so electric vehicles, and energy storage, so uh, stationary storage for renewable energy. That makes up almost 60% of the use of uh, lithium resources right now. It's a high value component of it. It's the most valuable chemical process or chemical to make from lithium. Uh, by 2025, it'll probably be over 70%. The two main uh, chemicals made are lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide. You can see on the right, uh, lithium carbonate making up almost, what do we have there? Just over 50% uh, of it. Uh, that will continue to grow as the um, chemistries are are refined, but battery materials, that is where the growth in lithium is. And it's still the first innings right now. So the auto era, the auto era for EVs hasn't uh, even happened yet, and we can see the massive demand for lithium and the uh, growth opportunity, but really the only name that people are familiar with is Tesla, and they have yet to produce even half a million cars. But if you were in China, you would see a, more than a dozen EV companies uh, a million EVs will be sold in China this year. They're producing 6,000 electric buses every year, or sorry, every month. So the growth is being uh, driven by China. But you're also seeing Volkswagen announced just recently a purchase uh, agreements for $25 billion worth of battery materials. That's the equivalent in electric vehicle, in, in lithium we measure it in gigawatt hours. That's the equivalent of 140 gigawatt hours of energy per year which is equivalent to just about the same amount in uh, thousands of tons of lithium, about 140,000 tons of lithium just for Volkswagen, their projected demand every year by the year 2025. Just to give you a concept of how much of the global demand that is, in 2017, global production of lithium was only just over 200,000 tons. So Volkswagen alone, 11%, they make 11% of the automotive market, but their, uh, so their forecasted demand will be 130 to 140,000 tons of lithium just for themselves. So about 40% of current world production for one automaker. Uh, Volvo has gone all in and GM, pretty much uh, Mercedes, BMW, Ford, they've all announced that they'll be rolling out EVs. So as much as if you're a believer or not, it is happening. You will see up to 50% of e uh, automotive vehicles by the year 2040 being electric vehicles and the other half of it will be energy storage. So putting in large scale storage for wind and solar power. Uh, Tesla put in a 104 or 129 megawatt battery. They put it in within 90 days of getting the contract in Southern Australia. Uh, Elon Musk has committed to putting a one gigawatt battery in somewhere in the United States this year. So energy storage will also make up a massive amount of the demand for lithium. And most of that it's not necessarily driven by consumers, but it's legislated. So on this slide, you can see the countries that are demanding or uh, regulating the adoption of the EVs. China is all in on it to control air pollution. Uh, the Netherlands is banning all internal combustion engines by 2025. Uh, the United States hasn't put a policy in place, but California is trying to have 1.5 million zero emission vehicles on the road by 2025. Uh, so you can see on the list that the demand is not necessarily consumer driven, but it is regulatory driven. This is the um, forecast for battery factories. The one battery factory that got a lot of notice in the year 2014 was Tesla. They announced a gigafactory in Nevada that got a lot of press as the world's biggest battery factory. Its projected production is 35 gigawatts per year. 
by 2023, there'll be 33 similar factories with 430 gigawatts of production. So that's equivalent to just around half a, half a million tons of lithium just required for the battery factories. This is the demand uh, projections. Currently, we're just over 200,000 tons of lithium demand per year, lithium carbon equivalent, that's how it's measured. Uh, by 2025, it will be greater than 800,000 tons, potentially a million tons, so five to four to five times current demand. And a lot of it has become now political. This is just to give you some history on the battery and where we've come. In 2009, the Times of London put out an article that said that lithium, lithium car batteries may shift the uh, balance of industrial power. It was controversial in the in the technology space and in the lithium mining space because it was very, uh, it, was, it was quite forward looking on it. But just this past April, the Chinese government warned the Chilean government that they didn't, they, the Chileans shouldn't block the acquisition of 24% of SQM, which is the world's second largest lithium producer, by a Chinese company because the Chinese want to lock up lithium supply. SQM did make a successful purchase of that 24%. It was announced two weeks ago, but just on Monday, the Chilean Competition Bureau lodged an investigation to see whether they should um, exclude the Chinese participation in the uh, acquisition of uh, control block of SQM because it is such a political hotspot in South America for uh, control of the lithium space. And it's that, that political aspect has moved to the US. In December 2017, President Trump issued an executive order on the supply, ensuring the secure, reliable supply of critical minerals, and lithium was one of those. The USGS has been tasked on finding ways to unlock lithium resources in the United States. So that's what focused part of our attention, well, primarily focused our attention on the US because we didn't want to remote, work on remote salaries in South America for brine projects, and we knew that we'd be able to leverage a lot of this news out of the US. So the first project that we acquired was in California, but the one I'm going to talk to you today about is one that's in a jurisdiction that people aren't familiar with uh, lithium on. If you have any experience in the lithium industry, and as I highlighted earlier, Australia and Argentina are the two hot names for it, but we're working in Arkansas, another, another jurisdiction that begins with A, and it is a region that, if you've been working in the lithium space, you recognize that it has been acknowledged as a massive lithium uh, resource opportunity. It just doesn't fit that conventional resource model, but it has everything that we looked at in project uh, de-risking uh, execution, uh, so we could de-risk the execution of it, um, as opposed to projects in remote salars where you don't have infrastructure, you don't have water, power, or gas. Arkansas is the chemical heartland of the South, it has everything there. It already has brine production from two large uh, chemical industrial companies. It's got rail, power, water, gas, and a trained workforce. Uh, it's got a supportive jurisdiction. In Chile, to bring a new project online, you need a concession from the government. They haven't granted a new one in over 30 years. In Arkansas, you don't need to worry about that. You don't need to worry about laying pipelines like you do in British Columbia. It's, it's got everything that's required to build a project. And it's got existing infrastructure. And because as I highlighted earlier, we're, we're all about data finding assets that we're, we're not explorers. It's got tons of data. It's been producing brine primarily for bromine for the last 50 years. So there's extensive amounts of data there. Just to give you an idea on the, where the brine comes from, this, it's a, a formation called the Smackover Formation. It was an oil and gas play in the 1940s and 1950s. There's still a lot of oil and gas production there. But it, in the center on the map there, you can see the purple region in the center. That's the uh, Smackover Formation. So it's an extensive porous permeable limestone aquifer. It's between six and 10,000 feet below surface. So it's not a, like a conventional lithium resource, which is either near surface or about 1,000 feet deep. It doesn't fit that traditional model. Uh, but it extends from eastern Texas all the way over into Florida. It has lithium grades running from around 150 milligrams per liter to 500 milligrams per liter. So roughly this, a similar chemistry to what you would find in Argentina. Uh, and currently it produces around 250 million barrels of brine every year for bromine and calcium uh, chloride extraction. And then the waste brine 
still rich in lithium is pumped back into the aquifer. So what we looked at as an opportunity was, there's only three chemical companies working in southern Arkansas. How could we find a relationship to sign a deal with one of them to access their tail brine or get a large enough land position that we could actually put a resource together? It's difficult to put a resource together in southern Arkansas because it's not like uh, mining claims in the western United States where you can stake ground with the BLM and just record it at, at the uh, county office. You actually have to do private land transactions, so it's thousands of leases to put together. So we looked at who are the current operators and would they be interested in working with a startup company on unlocking the resource. And we got a warm welcome when we knocked on their doors. Just to give you an idea on, uh, as well on the data points, when I said we focused on data, this is a 20 by 50 mile production fairway in southern Arkansas, and that's how many wells have been drilled in it for oil and gas or brine. So 2,000 wells in that 20 by 50 mile fairway. All the data stored at the Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission. So we knew going in that we would have, if we were able to get a resource, an, a land position or a uh, agreement in place, that we would have the data points to put together a resource and put together a model that would uh, define a lithium project. Just this last May, so the three main producers in Arkansas are Albemarle, who's also the world's largest lithium producer, but in southern Arkansas they produce uh, bromine, uh, a company called Tetra Technologies, and a big German multinational called Lanxis. So when we went into southern Arkansas, first we did a deal with Tetra. Tetra was, has been producing calcium chloride as a clear uh, drilling fluid for the last 25 years. Uh, when we knocked on their door in Houston in September 2017, their share price was $1.90. It had fallen from $13 the year before. Uh, they were obviously interested in doing deals where they could offset some of their ongoing costs. So we had a receptive audience when we talked to Tetra about acquiring part of their land position. They had 30,000 acres of brine leases in southern Arkansas that they were just sitting on. They had been sitting on them for 25 years. And we did a deal with them for the rights to the lithium in their brine leases uh, that we announced this last January. So it was the only large land position left in southern Arkansas. It was adjacent to Albemarle's production area. And uh, we got the land package for less than it would have cost us to go and knock on 1,200 doors because it's 1,200 mineral leases to put together that land package. Um, and we have the rights with, for the lithium on that. We're performing a 43101 work resource assessment work on that right now. But the big prize was going to be able to find a way to get access to the tail brine. So brine that is post-bromine extraction. So the Albemarle, who's the, the world's largest lithium producer, they're not interested in working with any startup companies uh, that might get in the way of their uh, lithium development. But Lanxis is a German multinational company, 19,000 employees worldwide, uh, 71 chemical plants around the world, three bromine processing facilities in southern Arkansas, 200 miles of pipeline, 70 production and reinjection wells, uh, average about 385,000 barrels of brine production every day. Take the bromine out. They sell some of their tail brine to Tetra. The reason Tetra had the 30,000 acres that we acquired is because they buy tail brine from Lanxis to pull the calcium chloride out. They buy about 35,000 barrels a day, but Lanxis produces 385,000 barrels of tail brine. So, and they, they, they put back in the ground. Just two weeks ago, we announced a binding MOU with Lanxis to pursue the commercial development of lithium, producing battery grade lithium materials from their tail brine and smack over brine, so our own brine asset in southern Arkansas. And what that brings uh, to standard is the exclusive access to their tail brine. We paid them three million US dollars as the first payment as a reservation fee on that. It also allows us to build a pilot plant inside of one of their permitted process facilities. So as Keith mentioned, and as I highlighted a little bit earlier, we're, look at it, we're looking at unlocking these by using a new process. It, we're not inventing a process per se, but using a selective extraction process. So. Uh, being able to install that inside a permitted chemical process plant 
that has all of the facilities there. It's got a brine supply line, a disposal line, and all of the other infrastructure in place, de-risks and reduces all of our capital expenditures on, our, on the biggest risk on the company, which is the technology. So we have access to build a pilot plant inside their facility. There's 150,000 acres of brine leases they have. That's 10,000 individual leaseholders that make up that 150,000 acre resource. We're going to put together a 43101 report on their asset as well, so we'll know the scale of the opportunity there. So now the opportunity in southern Arkansas is greater than 180,000 acres. We've been working with Lanxis for the last 10 months on this project. We just announced it two weeks ago, but over that 10-month period, they've allowed us to take thousands of liters of brine already and do chemical process work on it. They gave us the confidence to pay them $3 million to get access to their brine. So over the last 10 months, we've already done bench scale and mini pilot plant work at our own facility that we rent at SGS Lakefield in Ontario to put together the engineering drawings and flow sheet for that pilot plant. And we'll be building that pilot plant in Canada. We've hired a company called Zeton. They've built 800 pilot plants already, not lithium pilot plants, but 800 pilot plants already. Uh, probably the world's biggest pilot plant maker. They're making it in Canadian, Canadian dollars, so we'll build it in Canada and ship it to Arkansas to install it. This is what the location looks like uh, for the mineral claims. So you can see on the left, those are the 30,000 acres of claims that we have just to the west of Albemarle. Albemarle's got around 130,000 acres. They have two bromine processing facilities there. And then Lanxis, the biggest landholder there, just to the east with 150,000 acres. And you can see Tetra, who we leased the property on the west from, their facility is right in the heart of Lanxis's facility because they run off of Lanxis's tail brine, which is the business model that we're looking to approach. And you can see extensive pipelines, power lines, rail, everything's there at Southern Arkansas. It's the gateway to the Gulf of Mexico. It's got all of the requirements to build a project. Just some pictures of what the facilities at Lanxis look like. They have three bromine facilities. This is their central plant, their western plant, and their southern plant. The southern plant's where we're gonna build the pilot plant. These are some of their supply and disposal wells. They have a total of 70, 70 of these in place. That's the aerial view of the southern plant. And you can see the star on the far right there is where we're putting the pilot plant. They've already leveled the ground. They put an R bromine R&D facility in there last year, so they had extra space that they had left available for future growth. So the space has already been leveled. They have a full service rack, power, water, gas, steam, brine, everything there. So we just need to move our plant in, interconnect it. There's a laboratory 30 feet away, so we can do all of our work there. And there's a disposal well just at the top of the picture. You can see it, uh, the circle that's in the, the dark color there. As, and they all, there's a trained workforce, everything in place. I'm getting a five minute notice, so I'll just quickly get to our own 30,000 acres. As we're doing the work with Lanxis on their resource, because the area had been so well developed, it came with 979 wells drilled in or around the 30,000 acres we have. 256 of those, we've got the full production and exploration geological logs. 30 of those, we've got downhole core reports, and on 15 of them, we actually have the core samples. So putting together a resource, we've got a few million dollars worth of drill data already. Also 200 miles of 2D seismic that we got with it as well. So this was all included with the lease that we got. So we're well on the way to putting together a 43101 report on this. We've got agreements in place with one of the independent oil and gas companies that hold uh, oil and gas leases there. We're going to re-enter some of their wells and do brine sampling. So Drilling would be prohibitively expensive for us to do exploration work while we're doing the pilot plant, but re-entering the wells is only going to cost us a few hundred thousand dollars, so we'll be able to get brine samples and put chemistry together to get a very robust 43101 43 report that'll come out in Q3. And when people ask, why isn't Albemarle the world's biggest lithium producer if they've got a big asset in Arkansas doing this? Well, they built a pilot plant already. This is from their 2016 investor deck. Full transparency, it's not in their 2017 investor deck. They pulled this slide. But in their 2016 investor deck, they list Magnolia, Arkansas. So that's the county where their bromine facility is. World-class lithium brine resource. Unique only to Albemarle at that point, no longer. 
byproduct of bromine operation, all of our business model, ability to leverage infrastructure, no mining costs, byproduct of bromine uh, derivatives. You can see on the timeline, they've already run a pilot plant and they're ready for, for plant design. So it is in their business model. So Albemarle has acknowledged it. We knew this going in, but most of the people in the lithium industry are all heading to Chile or Argentina, not paying attention to that. Quickly on the time, or the, the, the extraction process, as I started this, I'm not the technical part of the company. This will give you a really high level um, view of how it works. It, and the traditional way of, of uh, producing lithium from brine is through evaporation ponds. So it's usually found in a continental salar. It's a near surface uh, salty water deposit. They pump it to the surface. It's generally found in regions that are in a desert. That's why it is concentrated. They pump it into large evaporation ponds, 5,000 to 10,000 acres. At, there's 10 stages of processing. This, through solar evaporation, they concentrate the brine between 12 and 18 months to get it to a uh, concentration between three and 6,000 milligrams per liter. And then they put it into a carbonation or a, a, um, uh, a refining stage. The process that we're looking to deploy in Arkansas, will do that in a few hours. So the first stage, because we're going to be getting, and we, we can say that with confidence because we're doing it mini pilot plant right now, and because we have the benefit of the particular brine that's in Arkansas, we're going to be getting it post-bromine extraction. So they've already taken out, because the brine is gas saturated, they've already taken out the hydrocarbons. They've taken out the bromine. They've pH balanced it, and they're giving it to us hot. So it's coming to us around 80 degrees Celsius. So it, the kinetic energy works better for chemical reactions. So we, and it's, and it's fairly clean. So we, first stage is pre-filtering with membranes, taking out any residual solids. And then the, the real heart of the process is the lithium selective extraction stage, which is the loading stage. And we'll be publishing a flow sheet on this probably before the end of the quarter. But we've identified and tested a very lithium selective, li lithium selective solid sorbent material. So it's a solid material that we put into mixer settler tanks. The filtered brine goes in, is mixed in the mixer settler tanks. Only the lithium is removed. It's highly selective for lithium. No catalysts or solvents are added. The material just grabs the lithium. We take it from the loading stage to a stripping stage. A dilute acid, it'll either be hydrochloric acid or if we're going to produce lithium chloride or sulfuric acid if we're going to produce lithium sulfate. That strips the lithium off of the sorbent material. The material returns to the loading stage, and that process starts again. After the stripping stage, we're left with a concentrated lithium solution that goes to a polishing stage to remove any residual cations or any residual hardness that's on it. And then we were left, we're left with a very high purity lithium solution that would go into a crystallization stage. That's a very high level look at it. I can put you in touch if you have technical questions with uh, our COO, but that's the process. I see Keith is coming up. And here's our timeline where we are today. So we've got uh, assessment work, resource assessment work on our 30,000 acre project underway now. As I said, we had lots of historic data. We're finalizing bench scale. It's actually mini pilot plant scale work in Ontario. We'll have the design for the mini pilot plant finished end of Q2, early Q3. Uh, the resource report for both the, our, our acreage and Lanxus's property, Q3, probably August this uh, Q3. We're going to break ground where we're going to locate the pilot plant late Q3, connect it to their pipelines in Q4, and the pilot plant will be running early next year. And it'll be a significant scale that it'll de-risk de the commercial application of the project. And we couldn't ask for a better partner. When you look at lithium projects, the hard part is not just building the resource asset, but putting a team together that you can say will be able to commercialize it. When you have a German specialty chemical company with 71 plants around the world. You couldn't ask for a better partner to commercialize it. So I'm going to leave it there because I see Keith is coming out. We do have a California asset that we're working. We'll have a technical report out late Q2 or early Q3 as well. It's more of a classic Salar. It is already in production as well. Uh, Tetra Technologies has an asset there. Uh, that's what it looks like now with classic evaporation ponds. The key to unlocking this is using a hybrid of our process technology for California. We're going to run brine from California through the Arkansas project because they're both connected by rail. There's a rail spur at our California project and a rail spur in Arkansas. I'll skip through those and we can uh, <laughs> follow up after. Yeah. Um, yeah. Robert, okay. So much. Oh. Sorry? Yes, it is. 
it has a provisional patent right now. Yes. And, it's, and our approach is, I think I highlighted it, it's we didn't create the technology to sell it to put onto other assets because it's, we did it backwards. We found the project and then found the best technologies that would work on that, and then we patented the application of that process for the project. But not the no, and particularly our partners on it. They're, they're working with us. That's, that's, our, that's our blue sky, yeah. Sorry? Yes. Yeah, we're just in the process of finalizing the engineering drawings. The flow sheet should be published. Uh, and the, uh, at mini pilot plant scale, the efficiencies should be published this quarter. Robert will be here at 4.30 when Brent's card as well. Thank you.